uh, if you don't put enough nitrogen in it or if you don't build up an actual pile. You don't, it, the, you don't grow your bacteria. Yeah. Oh, you should be growing your bacteria. Oh. Yeah. Speaking of bacteria, welcome to the Genus Brewing live stream. This happens every Sunday, and I don't even know if it's for live yet. I'm probably going to jump the gun here, and um, part of what I just said will get cut off. But, uh, let's see here. I got, I got an ad playing, so. Yeah. Damn you ads. Dang it ads. We could just turn these off. I don't think you can for live streams, can you? I don't know if you can. We've been live for 20 seconds. Nice. Skip ads. Perfect. New candy shop. Adopt me. Steal kids. That doesn't sound like what I want. Spending 24 hours on top of a mountain. Also not what I want. Okay. Genus brewing. All right. Where the magic begins. Are you ready? I don't know. I've got to find a live stream. off to a fantastic start there. Sweet. Well, that's good. You know, good to know that I can accidentally do things sometimes. <laughs> All right. Everyone, welcome to our Genus live stream. Uh... Yeah, sorry that our throats are a little uh, kind of weird sounding this morning. But We've been is... smoking nonstop for the last 48 hours. Pretty much, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, we uh, do this live stream every single Sunday at 8.45 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Ryan, stop making noise. Uh, <laughs> every once in a while, we invite Ryan here to make noise in the background just because that's what we like to do. And what we like to do is we talk about some beer news across the country or world. We talk about some news that happens here in the tap room. What's the latest update on Genus Brewing? Then we go into our beer of the week and we break down a style via BJCP style guidelines. Talk about our favorite malts, hops, and yeasts to use with that style. And then we go into a couple of discussion topics where we talk about whatever makes sense at the time to talk about and we end with a q a perfect uh for those of you that will be tuning in on our podcast welcome back to our live stream uh yeah i think that's good enough for the podcast honestly yeah yeah podcast nerds podcast suck at podcast nerds. guys uh, you just get a shorter intro <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, well, shall we get, get started with it? Huh? Yeah, let's get going. Okay. So genus, uh, no, we start with some beer news. Uh, um, well, you, you had the first one. So why don't you jump into the, what is going on in the beer world this I'm week? I'm actually on the wrong live stream right now too. Why? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, why does this not look right? Anyway, why are you on Belle Delphine's live stream? For beer news. Uh, why is it not popping up? Okay. Anyway, for, for beer worry, news, uh, we have, uh, from what right I could live find, stream. lifestyle beer stuff coming out logan's mic is quieter don't worry we've got a sound guy here to fix that there we got i can also get a little closer to my mic too that's true yeah um, that might help your mic is a little farther away i had to adjust mine so i'm super close How's that i have them set everybody? pretty similar but that should be much better uh logan is on the one on that side i have them set to our sides <laughs> so he's on the, the no mic he's on one. one okay um, so, yes, Lifestyle Beer is apparently being a branded thing by Deschutes Brewery is the, is the brewery that I actually saw doing this with, like, Orbiter IPA. Yeah. And it's kind of right along the same lines of a low-cal, low-ABV beer, um, which, crazy enough, like, when was that, five years, six years ago, um, people tried to do this, and it was called the uh, Session IPA, and yet that fell flat on its face. So I kind of laughed when I saw that. So we'll kind of see how that goes um, because the whole branding of like a session something um, really did not work. Beer uh, names and styles these days are literally just branding. That's all they are. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really curious to see what happens with the quote unquote lifestyle branded um, beers. And uh, other news, someone says that you don't look as homeless today. So that's as uh, homeless. Nice. That's, that's a positive. Uh, Taking a uh, <laughs> step up in the world. Give yeah. it like two weeks to look homeless again. <laughs> I did shear myself. So, yep. Uh, don't worry. There's like three dogs now that all have very nice warm coats for winter. Uh, more people are jumping onto the non-alcoholic craft beer train. Uh, Athletic Brewing Company kind of hit it really, really big in yeah. re in uh, in the recent like last four or five months. A lot of people are jumping on that non-alcoholic, um, making good quality craft beer. And now you've got big boys like Coors and Boston Beer, which is the owner yeah. of Sam Adams, doing the same thing. Yeah. So those are some huge players getting into the game. Um, I'm actually like, so I'm really curious. What did because obviously these guys have a lot of money at stake, so yeah. I'm, I'm really what is changing about the market in this? That, that's the one thing that you know, it's like I see these things coming out, I definitely see all these people jumping on board, but <clears> I'm really confused. I'm like, I because I'm not sure how the market is changing so much that there's going to be such a high demand for non alcoholic beer. I think there's a small handful of Americans saying, Hey, maybe America is a little fat and we should change. <laughs> a little fat, a little fat, diabetes. 
<laughs> the diabetes. Um, yeah, but anyway, really, really interested to see kind of what comes out and, uh, you know, who else jumps on that bandwagon. So. Yeah, I'm actually excited to see if it, like, really takes off. I've uh, thought about buying some non-alcoholic beers for the yeah. rare occasion where I need my beer to be non-alcoholic. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I need to try that other thing, too, where we made, tried to make that, like, 1% alcohol beer. Yeah, but... Oh, the, I need to try that again without well, scorching we gotta, it. Yeah, we got to try it with uh, um, the, the one... There's a non-alcoholic yeast that Fermentus makes that we need to get in and see if... Oh, yeah, we should we can figure that, that out. Too. Yeah. See if we can try it out. <sighs> All Why right. Not? And then uh, lastly, uh, which kind of <clears throat> goes into our news as well, is uh, wildfires are basically hosing us here in the um, kind of whole West Coast, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if On the other side of the camera from where you guys are, the entire sky is just... Give him a pan, yellow. Ryan. Yeah. That's not actually fog out there. That's uh, That's all... That is all smoke. Yeah, <laughs> it is crazy. Yeah. So, um, so we are at the actually dangerous levels. <laughs> just look at this. <laughs> yeah, look at it's that. It's absolutely blown out. <laughs> you guys can't see any of that. That's not actually fog. It's just really, really bright. <laughs> Any, yeah <laughs> but uh yeah so it's pretty bad actually we even decided to close down um the brewery today just because the it's it dangerous is, levels outside yeah like and even though when we have our hazardous. ac yeah it's hazardous uh even when we have our ac on like it's filtering out some of it but we can still feel the effects in here it's definitely yeah not healthy in here um but uh yeah it's a uh, hazardous level starts at like 300 uh, rating of like 300 i don't know it's parts per million or something yeah. like that whatever the rating is and we got up to almost 500 here that means yeah, we are in like still at 460 this morning i looked it up yeah it's, it's getting it's very very bad i mean and yesterday it was at like it starts to get to sort of unhealthy at like 100 yeah. so we are several times above that not as bad um, as salem oregon i yeah. guess uh, a couple oh, days someone, someone just commented we're down in salem and it's not oh. that <laughs> And it's not that bad, but it still sucks. Yeah, it was uh, apparently somewhere <laughs> over by you guys in Salem a couple days ago. Uh, your levels actually went off the chart from what I heard, Yeah. Um, which it goes up to 600. And at that point, they just figured nothing would ever get that bad. And yet yeah. it got that bad for a couple days. It was some it was some city that started with an M and it was a... Uh, that I couldn't correct. Magras? Madras. Mad Madrid, Spain. Oh my gosh. Uh, he's, Madri sorry, Peter grew up over here. He doesn't, he's not very, yeah. Uh, Madrid, Madrid, Spain, Oregon is where it got, yeah, it must have been some <laughs> sort of weird pocket, but it got crazy high over there. <laughs> Anyways. Anyways, yeah. In Spokane, it's now bad enough that most businesses should be shutting down and encouraging people to not be outside because it is yep. a health hazard. All right. Um, anyway, so what else happened around Genus this week? Uh, let's see. We got, um, oh, we have uh, some really high alcohol beers on tap apparently yeah i don't know why we started doing this but it sounded like a fun idea we had there's a, a brewery that's a, about a mile away from us that makes a lot of high alcohol beers and so we were like all right we're gonna challenge them to make more high alcohol beers and so we just started making them and now we have uh we have five uh beers on tap that are above 10 percent alcohol our yeah. highest one being 13. yeah so um kind of ridiculous i honestly i i know how this happened though um so this is actually a result yeah, of part of the shutdown back in march yeah when when everything got shut down completely um, and we realized that, you know, brewing hazy IPAs probably wasn't the best idea since we weren't going to be moving them real fast for a few months. Um, we started brewing really high alcohol beers. And here we are six months later. And all those high alcohol beers are tasting fantastic. And next thing you know, we have a ridiculous amount of them on tap. Yeah. So, um, you know, is what it is. I'm actually not mad at it. I think it's an awesome niche that like, yeah. I guarantee you no other brewery in Spokane has anything close to what we have for, for boozy beers. So. Yeah. The weird, um, it's just, it's a weird thing for me because it's just definitely not our style. It's not what we usually yeah. drink. It's not what we usually make. It's <laughs> just like, we decided to make a bunch of them because of the COVID shutdown. And now we're, yeah. Now we're loaded. We got two barley wines. We've got a Belgian quad that was aged on Brett. We've got uh, uh, Imperial cereal stout. A and Belgian then a, double IPA. Uh, yeah, double that's IPA. That's probably more, of a, yeah, probably more of a triple IPA. So, really, Ryan? <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, Ryan's over there just <laughs> with the garbage <laughs> cans. In the All right. Anyway, you guys can't that's see that. That's probably a pretty good picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we got also a video on doing the uh, Letra Raw um pseudo lager out this week too so yeah, that was released on friday it's a, it's a shorty but a goodie it's got a lot of good information in and it's yeah. uh showing you the strategies they're telling you basically the strategies that we used to make a uh, a very very clean raw beer basically a beer that uh, take took a lot less work than normal but using the power of science we were able to make it crisp and clear yeah exactly so that was that was kind of fun that's um i'm actually stoked about how that turned out too yeah um sounds like letra is going to be a, a go-to yeast for us in the future future 
Um, all right. Um, also started round two of uh, kind of hard seltzers. Uh, doing, we actually scaled up the batch too a little bit. Yeah, so we did a one barrel this time for round two because uh, the first time we did a hard seltzer, it uh, went really fast and people seemed to enjoy it. And so now we're going to do the same thing 100% with French Saison yeast. And we are going to be experimenting with different flavoring mechanisms this way. So we're going to split the one barrel batch into uh, a couple different kegs and flavor them differently. Yeah, it definitely seems so far that uh, when it comes to seltzers that, that using um, some kind of an ale yeast that's gonna produce um, a high ester profile is, is the best way to go there. Yeah. So as for like nutrient additions, um, the, the jury is still out. That's something we're gonna have to play around with a little bit more. As for now, we're sort of throwing the kitchen sink at it just to make sure we don't have any issues there. Yeah, so we'll do some smaller trials on the nutrients and really dial in what we think is gonna be best and let you guys know when we have a final, this is how to make the best uh, seltzer. But I would, uh, you know, honestly, our first round turned out really well. So we're, we're excited for where that's going. We're excited to do more trials. And uh, we're excited to have another one on tap pretty soon. Yeah. So finally, we also have a um, sort of juicy-esque IPA that we brewed with uh, those African hops that we had mentioned. They are, um, what, a Southern Passion? An African Queen. An African Queen. Is just those two? Just those I two? there's one other one. Yeah, so Southern Passion is actually a little bit more of like a noble-esque kind of flavored hop. It's really not that big and juicy. Yeah. Um, classic. Think like a cluster or like a um what's that s one that's uh comes S sapphire no not sapphire i was thinking like a the one that that's uh, the american that we use a lot oh, it starts with an s anyways it's like seven percent has those same uh, noble origins kind of flavors but a little bit higher alcohol or higher alpha acid um it's gonna come to me as soon as like i'm done like skipping over one. it yeah, but uh, it's definitely not, uh, it's got that noble flavor and not a lot of big juiciness. Uh, African Queen is like the galaxy of the African hops is so far as I, I have seen, but still definitely not as big and juicy as African uh, or as Galaxy. So um, we went ahead and did a juicy IP with those and it's turning out really good, but it's definitely more in that uh, like wheat beer, grassy hop. Yeah, profile. it's got like, that's, it's got a certain spiciness to it. It does have like definitely an underlying. Sterling, that's what it was. Someone got it. Thing. Sterling's not American. Sterling's American. I thought Sterling was German. No, oh, Sterling's a. Never mind then. It's a, I think it's a Tetning derivative, actually. Oh, but, all right. Never yeah. mind. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's got some mango. Got uh, I picked out especially on the nose. Um, actually, almost like this like borderline floral herbal Vermont character. Yeah. Um, too, which I actually really like. I think that's something that. Um, while yeah, and a juicy, maybe, maybe not like the absolute best fit. Um, but, uh, for other styles, I feel like that can, that we can really play with, you know, a character that's that unique. So, yeah, I think it'd be, honestly, I would say that they'd be really good to kind of mix up a, a West coast with. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. I feel like yeah, more, a lot of flavor, but more West coast. I mean, even toning them down, doing sort of an IPL with them, um, throwing them at like, uh, a hoppy red even. I feel like I feel like honestly just that, that exact profile that we got right now. If you just did that with a real malt forward beer, yeah, um, even a Northwest style IPA, you see which we may there? yeah lead into what we're gonna be doing. Uh, yeah, we're gonna oh, be doing oh that. yeah yeah we're gonna be trying to uh, do a video t later today on how to uh, brew up the perfect Northwest style IPA. The best. So all right, well I think that sums it up for our genus news. Guess what time it is now? Time for. Beer of the week, bump bump bump. Beer of the week, and today, and only to fit the occasion, uh, we are doing category six B BJCP, which is a Rauk beer. Because you know, if you like it smoky, you like it smoky, <laughs> and uh, we're, we've kind of been inundated with this. I don't know what could have brought this to our mind, but uh, <laughs> yeah, for I mean, whatever reason, it's smoke I mean, on our mind. Fun facts: we have actually like eight. Well, well, no, we got more than that. We got like 14 Rauk beers on tap right now. We sure do. <laughs> uh, and I think it might be closer to 20. And two Rauk ciders. <laughs> and two Rauk ciders. <laughs> oh, and a couple of Rauk sodas as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you have not caught on to that pun yet, um, Rauk actually translates quite literally into smoked beer um, in German. And traditionally, this is um, a very, very old world style of beer. It's typically... Hey, um, the brew show's on. What's... Oh, sorry. I'm just in it. Yeah. Uh, so typically it is um, to the style more or less of a Merzen, actually. So this is going to be an amber, uh, traditional German amber lager, um, but with smoked malt in it. So you get this um, generally 
at least noticeable to sometimes a very strong smoky character to it. And uh, a lot of people don't realize, especially a lot of people in America don't realize that Marison actually is a fairly broad color category. So it goes from like an orangish yellow all the way into an actual amber amber. It's not just that American deep caramel looking amber. It has a pretty broad spectrum, but it's definitely amber compared to your German pills. Yes. Um, in fact, technically Rausch beer is, is a little bit darker um, than uh, what the Marison category um, falls into. I believe it was 12 to 22 SRM. Pulling um, it up, if, six. Uh, yeah, if I remember correctly. Um, so yeah, so so you are looking yeah. at um, kind of a, a nice deep gold all the way into um, that nice rosy amber color um, when it comes to the range. As a general rule of thumb, the lighter and paler these beers are, the more intensely smoky they're going to be. And um, as you get more along the darker end, as you get a little bit sweeter in the malt character, more richness to back that up, um, they're going to be more subtly smoky as well. Yeah. Um, and then one last thing to note before we kind of give a breakdown of all the ingredients that uh, we would use on this is that while these are malt forward beers, um, just like a lot of German lagers are, um, they are still highly attenuated and crisp in the finish. And a lot of times the smoke will even accentuate that. So um, this isn't quite like, um, you know, an American amber ale or like a Bach beer would be where they're kind of sweet through and through. Right. Um, so always, uh, really, really, Peter. Uh, so always uh, take that into it. consideration. Um, grain bills are going to be simple um, and you want to make sure that these beers attenuate out fully. All right. So anyway, let's go on to speaking of grain bills, the malt of the week. So this is a pretty straightforward one, actually. Um, Best Malls uh, makes a fantastic smoked malt. It is a beechwood smoked malt called Rauch Malt. Yep. Oddly enough, right? Who would have known? And uh, they say you can use this actually from 20% all the way up to 100% of the grain bill. Um, this is a fantastic malt to use as your base malt. Um, this is one that we've carried for years, and it's in this spectrum of smoked malts, in my opinion, is actually quite mild. Right, and if you haven't uh, gathered a theme, we do use Best Malts a lot. Uh, Special X and Red X both come from Best Malts. Heidelberg comes from Best Malts. Uh, of course, when it comes to smoked beer, we are using their Roush Malt. It's, mm -hmm. The nice thing about the Best Malts Roush Malt, it is a cleaner smoke profile. A lot of smoked malts come with an extra meatiness or an extra richness that can kind of be distracting in this style of beer. So you want something that can be uh, a little bit clean, even if used at a higher percentage, which is why the Beechwood smoked malt that Best Malts makes, I think, is the perfect one to use yeah, for a Roush really beer. Yeah, really good as a as an overall base um, with that said it is a bit on the lighter side it is only going to run you kind of around that two um lova bond range yeah um, so so <laughs> it is a pretty pale malt in order to get that color um, a lot of times what people do is um, add just a very small amount of either um, some roasted malts like probably like carafa actually would be um, the better way to go there um, but also um, feel free to add a little bit of maybe some aromatic munich or even a, just a touch you know, maybe four ounces or so of, uh, four, maybe even eight ounces um, of like some Munich 30, some dark Munich to really give you that breadiness in the beer, you know, for a five gallon batch too. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, otherwise, you know, keep it fairly simple. Um, don't feel afraid to even do an extended boil to maybe get a little Maillard reaction, maybe even do a decoction mash if you're feeling, uh, feeling, feeling wily. like you want to spend an entire day on <laughs> brewing. <laughs> yeah, if you're feeling wily. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, that, so otherwise, simple grain bill. Load it up with some Roush malt. Um, make that happen. So, uh, Sidebar, someone did also just mention that it is NFL today. I didn't, uh, I didn't get into a fantasy football league this year because, you know, football was kind of weird this year. So if anyone wants to go ahead and invite me, um, please, uh, please invite me to your fantasy football league. I need some. Hell brews. Thank you for the uh, super chat. Oh, awesome. Wow. Is that, is that a super chat? I don't know if I don't that's know what a that super is. chat. Um, but, uh, yeah. yeah. It is, yeah. M MXC, I think. Most Extreme Elimination Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, back to my childhood. MXEC? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Most extreme elimination challenge. Uh, <laughs> don't get eliminated. Woo! <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> so let's keep going here. Um, and, uh, yeah, so on to our um, hop of the week. And I chose Oh, by the way, Hellbrews, uh, just a side note, they also have a YouTube channel. Uh, oh, do they? Yeah. Oh, very nice. So if you guys are interested in Definitely brewing check channels, yeah, check them out. Um, so yes, uh, Spalt is going to be our hop of the week. Spalt is a very, very traditional. I mean, actually it is more or less, I think the traditional German hop. I mean, yes, you can argue, argue that with uh, Hallertau, but yeah, it turns out yeah, that Spalt it is, is a classic noble. Like the, it, uh, it has been around since the eighth 
century. That's a long time. The eighth century. Yeah. Uh, um, so classic land race. Almost hop. as old as your attitude. <laughs> Wow. Uh, classic <laughs> Landrace hop, uh, daughter of the Spalter Select, um, which is actually a different hop. A lot of people think those are the same thing. Um, while they do so share their um, similar characteristics. Genetics. Um, I think the Spalter is typically a little bit higher alphas. Um, got a little more flavor punch to it. So It's the, it's the bread for, um, oh, the, oh, that's Mexican pesos. <laughs> oh, oh, that's Mexican pesos. Hellbrew's channel, I believe, nice. is in Spanish. Uh, <laughs> if you uh, like some Spanish channel action. Uh, so, yeah. And otherwise, the profile of Spalt is um, going to be earthy and spicy, um, fairly delicate. And one of the things I like about this hop, especially for the style of beer, is that while it has fairly low alpha acids, um, you're looking at maybe 4% or so, um, maybe 5 if it's a little bit higher. Um, the betas are actually pretty high relative to that. So you're still looking at three to 4% beta acids, which means that in a beer that's probably going to be aged for a while, probably going to be lagered for, you know, three, four five months. Um, those betas are really going to stick around, um, and provide a nice kind of round hop char characteristic to the beer. Yeah. So. And it's an under, it's an underused hop. Honestly, a lot of people don't realize, uh, um, it is. It's yeah. People it's, don't use spalt anymore. And it works really well in any kind of really traditional beer that you're wanting a more delicate, more classic hop profile to. For a while, we we're using spalt for like a lot of our colches and cream ales and stuff like yeah. that, just because it is. It's got that delicate but nice earthy presence. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. That is our hop of the week. As for our yeast of the week, um, nothing really to be surprised about here. But that is going to be Imperials. Um, Harvest. Harvest is a nice lager strain that does throw a little bit of sulf sulfur and minerality uh, along with fermentation. It has a subtle fruitiness without being excessively fruity. And so it's just a good round hop to kind of jump in and build the malt profile of this beer, accentuate malts without getting, you know, excessively estery or excessively distracting because too many esters or really any noticeable amount of esters in the style are going to be not okay. Yeah, so a true lager strain um, going to really push through that softness, push through a really delicate um, kind of classic German fruitiness is what I, I would call it. Um, and the reason I chose this over um, something like the global strain, that kind of Weinsteffen strain, um, is that that Weinsteffen strain does tend to push through any kind of minerality um, to the water. And so this strain will actually just soften this beer up ever so slightly more to kind of let that smoke come through in the, really the way it should. Right. Um, cause one thing I guess to note about this is that, um, while smoke is a form of polyphenol, um, the, these beers should not taste phenolic. So they shouldn't have that sort of classic wit beer or kind of French Saison, um, in your face aggressiveness. Um, they should definitely be very, very smooth. The smokiness should be like, I don't like how, why would you describe it? Almost, um a smoked salmon more smoothness i i feel like that even that can be too intense sometimes yeah i agree like, like a smoked like, cheese sure I, I, th <laughs> I, th I think you're gonna say something like the you know the wood from the when you're smoking on a cedar plank like that kind of smoke okay yeah or, or but yeah too. but it's, it's definitely not like a fruity smoke and it's not like a spicy smoke yeah the smoke should never be astringent it should never be overly phenolic by the way um, phenols are a very very broad category and so uh you can i mean you have the you know, the clove phenol which is the most common one that you see in yeah. like whip beers and then uh, there are a lot of other phenols there's you know, polyphenols which are going to be plasticky bad phenols smoke phenol is very specific and this should be a fairly one note smoke <clears throat> yep, exactly. And part of that also is going to come from the extended aging. Um, that will also smooth out the smoke character in the beer. Um, that's why a lot of smoked beers are aged for quite a bit. Hey, just like our beer on tap. So mm -hmm. um, brewed back. That was, was that February or March? Uh, that was February. I think that was February. And, yeah. it, and we are just now tapping it. And I think it's tasting better than it ever has. And so. the beer that we're talking about is our Stein beer that we did in the Anvil Foundry a little under a year ago, probably last February. Um, one of the first big uh, projects that Ryan was here for, which is kind of fun. Um, if you haven't watched us make a Stein beer in an Anvil Foundry, I think it's hilarious. You should it go is, watch it. It was a very good video. It was fun to make, too. Yeah. Um, we need to do more of those. <laughs> more like that. So, yeah, so that is our yeast. And then finally, our water, speaking of minerality, um, I kind of went for a moderate. We busted the 500 mark. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so I kind of uh, went for a moderate uh, profile when it came to overall hardness. Um, we'll probably post this 
for those of you watching later in the description. Um, but just to kind of give you a rundown, um, yeah, we got that right there. Ca if you can read it, <laughs> some uh, calcium carbonate levels of right around 100, so fairly low there. Um, lots of dissolved calcium, though. You always want to make sure your dissolved calcium is about 60 or above. Um, just because that's going to help that mash convert properly. Um, and then about 20 ppm of dissolved sulfates and about 60 ppm of dissolved chloride. So we got a little bit higher, you know, about a 3 to 1 chloride to sulfate ratio. And then j about 15 ppm of dissolved sodium and about 20 ppm of dissolved magnesium. So just a little touch of both of those. Again, magnesium is kind of more for um, just making sure your mash can convert. And then that sodium is going to give you just a little bit um, of that rounder mouth feel in the finish. So, um, yeah, but if you need that, uh, recap, just pause the video like two minutes ago and zoom into where my fingers were. Kurt says 500 watt. I'm, I'm wondering about that too. Oh, is that, that our air quality? Yeah. Oh, wow. That is okay. Yeah. We, we, we passed the 500 air quality badness marks. That is pretty bad. <laughs> Kurt yeah, says don't go outside. Cough, are, cough. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. We're, we're in, inside an insulated building with a filtration system and we're still feeling it. Mm, nice. All right, and that is our beer of the week. Hopefully, you all enjoyed that. So let's get right into discussion um, topic number one, which is using homegrown hops. Uh, so I think around the country right now, everyone is harvesting their hops from home. I think this is it's literally like this week is when everybody's doing it too. Yeah. If you're watching from New Zealand or Australia, you can go ahead and harvest your baby hops. <laughs> They're not going to have cones on. Yeah, they're not going to have any cones they're on them. Be, but uh, fact, if you just want to feel like you're part of the team, they're going to be like. <laughs> You're going to be like this tall, <laughs> a few feet tall. Um, and <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah, so everybody's harvesting their homegrown hops. So we get flooded every time, every year with questions of, hey, I've got these homegrown hops. My buddy's got these homegrown hops. How do I put them in beer? Yeah. And the first thing that we usually tell people is don't expect what you would expect from commercially bought hops. A lot of people, you know, they'll come up with their favorite IPA recipe, which has a hop addition at 16 minutes, 45 minutes, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, and zero minutes. And they use their homegrown hops into it. And on occasion that can randomly work out. But the, the important thing you got to know is that it is completely random. It's really, really hard to have high oil content or very specifically targeted aromatics from homegrown hops. Yeah, so ultimately, your hops that you're <coughs> growing are not going to be the same hops that they're growing over in Yakima, like the big boys are. Um, and, you know, I'm going to throw out a $5 word here, and it's called terroir. Uh, and uh, I've actually looked into a few different things on especially how weather affects hops, too. Um, yes. So uh, ultimately, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a complicated thing, but your microclimate, your soil that the hops are growing in, how much water you're giving them, um, even the humidity actually has a huge impact. How long on, per day the sun is hitting your yeah, hops how and long, from what yeah, direction? How far north you're at. Um, those all have a huge impact on the actual flavor profiles of hops. Uh, and I say this regardless of the hop strain. Um, and so what I mean by this is that if you have Columbus, it's not commercially it's, bought Columbus. Yeah, it's not going to be the Columbus, even in Spokane. Um, is not going to taste the same as Columbus grown just down in Yakima, which is only 100 miles away from here. It's practically walking distance. So, <laughs> practically walking distance. Or the same Columbus grown over in the Midwest, which somebody, right. was that the one somebody sent? It was us? Chinook. Or was that Chinook? Yeah. Yeah, but it tasted super purple. Yeah, so like super, super purple Chinook, um, which is fun. Um, so, But the bottom line is that don't expect the same results. With that said, embrace the results. So here's how you're going to use those hops to make sure that you're number one, maximizing the aromatics, and number two, reducing the uh, chlorophyll or the green bitterness that can come from using a fresh plant. Yeah, so generally speaking, we will always recommend the best use for any kind of homegrown hops is a big giant whirlpool. Yeah, whirlpool or a hop stand if you don't have the ability to do moving uh, you know, water around your hops. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to get a secondary or a side vessel and throw all your hops in, into that side vessel. Then put your worts into that hop contraption um, and, and make sure that they have uh, time to maximize that contact or that surface area. Or if it's in one vessel, throw them all in a giant hop bag and whirlpool around that hot bag in the one vessel. And this is going to be below boiling temperature. Uh, this is, for, first of all, 
because uh, boiling temperature with a lot of plant matter can actually get you that green astringent bitterness that you don't want from hops, but it's also going to reduce the rate at which the oils from the hops are volatilizing or evaporating, meaning whatever aromatics are in those hops, which like we said, is going to be lower than if it were a uh, commercially bought hop, uh, those aromatics will stay in the beer and you can really get a better perception of what your homegrown hops are tasting and smelling like. Yeah, so as a general practice, what we always recommend is bitter your beer to whatever kind of level of bitterness you want with a known hop variety that you know what the alpha acids are um, and then add these hops to the whirlpool um, you know any any time basically below boiling um, but also one thing to note is that if you are using them fresh off the vine which i know most people actually will be doing um, you do have to consider the ratio at which you're using these. Um, I, I can't tell you how many recipes I, I see people are like, oh, yeah, I'm going to add two ounces. I'm going to add four ounces. Um, and the bottom line is when you try to compare them to something like your traditional pellet hops, I mean, I've seen ratios as much as 12 or 16 to 1, which means that for every one ounce of you know dried pellet hops that you're adding to your beer, you're actually adding a pound of your fresh wet hops to this beer, which means that you might be adding four, five, uh, I think I've done 12 pounds in, uh, it was like an eight gallon batch of beer once. We so. did, uh, we did f uh, 30 pounds in a 25 gallon yeah. for that in one a, video. In a, yeah, in a one barrel batch. So yeah, um, so, yeah, so you're, you're adding tons and tons of these hops. So, you know, you have so much plant matter and there's so much, so many hops going into that beer. Um, you you got to have a way to sort of maximize the utilization of those hops. And that's why if you can recirculate, if you can get that wort to move around them just to try to get more access to those lupulin glands um, and get more oil dissolved into the beer, uh, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. So think about, first of all, you're basically going to soak these hops. And with that, you should also realize you're going to lose a lot of liquid volume. Yep. And, so, and that's, yeah, that's yeah. the next thing. Um, I always tell people um, plan for an extra 15 to 20 percent volume when you're brewing a beer with these hops because when you are you know when you're making up a five gallon batch of beer and you're throwing two or three pounds of hops which yeah. is like several gallons worth of of wet hops into this beer um, you're going to absorb a lot of water so you know for a five gallon batch shoot for a six gallon batch yeah and if you want to um, get that alcohol up just plan on adding sugar simple sugars during the fermentation process uh dextrose cane sugar uh, honey, even whatever you want to do, but simple uh, sugars during the fermentation can get that alcohol up um, without sacrificing the sugars that you already have from your mash. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So how we're going to do this is <coughs> like Peter said, you can bag your hops. Um, and then what I've actually done, I like to bag it, bag yeah, it up. What I've done when I've bagged them is basically try to submerge them. And then I'm sure people have heard of, you know, the, the shoots fresh squeezed IPA. Um, you're going to take that to a whole new level where you're actually going to take your bag out um, you're going to try to get some thick gloves. Or you're going to try to get some kind of like a, a screen you can sanitize. And you're going to press the living daylights out of those to try to get as much much of your uh, sweet wort back out of them as possible. Um, especially because that's going to be even more concentrated than what's been absorbed by them. Um, the other way to do things, um, which is a way that I think we've done it quite a bit here, is clean out your mash tun uh, really, really well after you do um, your mash and actually put those hops in your mash tun and then pump that beer back into your mash tun, which you're going to basically do a big hop stand with. Yeah. Um, and you're going to do this, um, generally speaking, um, 170, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. You want it pretty hot just to try to extract as much of that lupulin out as you can, um, but not quite boiling at the same time. Um, and then lastly, um, if you do have a hot back, this is a fantastic use for them. Because they um, act as a really good filter, and actually they will absorb less liquid than dehydrated hops if you use them in, in the hot back. Yep. And so it's, they're a great filtration method uh, without having to pre-soak your hot back, basically. Yeah, I honestly think that's probably the best method to use them, but I also realize that that is... Not everyone uh, has it. That is very much out of the reach for um, yeah. the, the vast majority of homebrewers. So, um, so yeah, so that's going to be the best way to use them. And, um, you know, otherwise you can technically use these hops at any point in the process. Like we said before, 
you just have to be aware that you it's know, not going to give you the same results. You, it's yeah, not going to be consistent. You don't have that consistency that you're going to have um, <clears throat> with known hop varieties, which is usually why we don't recommend doing them. And we got a, a lot of people kind of naysaying fresh hop beers, and I kind of in the in the same boat. As a commercial brewery, I'm probably not going to be making a fresh hop beer. I don't think it makes sense for us. I don't think it makes sense for a lot of it's people. A lot of work for no payoff. Yeah, and there was a it, it, it was a really good gimmick or marketing thing a, a handful of years ago, and then everyone started doing fresh hop beers, and we started realizing they're just not that special. And and they also don't necessarily taste better. They, yeah, I was going to say, more often than not, that, that's the biggest thing I know is that they just don't taste as good. They, they taste like a they taste like an uh-huh. IPA with a little extra greenness, and that's yeah. about it. And there's uh, – oh, you pinned our merchandise. Uh, yeah, if you want to buy a T-shirt, by the way. Um, that support us by buying a T-shirt. Um, Ryan's just over here doing work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, – but uh, you know what? That's what I will I was say too is that most commercial breweries, when they're using advertising their quote-unquote fresh hop beers, um, a lot of times those are actually dried hops. Um, they're not. They're not the kind of fresh hops that you think of at home as as hey, come over, pick my hops. We're going to throw them in a beer today. Um, while some of them are as close as you can get to that, as in the farms basically picking hops, ship overnight shipping them to somebody, and they're throwing them in beer. Um, fresh hop does not necessarily mean um, wet hop. It just means that they've basically used whole leaf hops nowadays. Um, so there's really no, no, uh, um, what's the term I'm thinking of? Like no regulation on that to say what is or isn't fresh hop. Right. Um, which is kind of one of those things. Where a it's true, like, yeah, yeah. A true wet hop though is the, the, you already said that 24 hours uh, straight yeah. off the bind into the beer, straight off the bind into the beer. Um, so yeah, at home though, you know what, go for it. Um, if you do want to use your homegrown hops for dry hopping, um, this is kind of the last thing we'll cover on them. Um, I do recommend drying them, and that's just because um, a lot of times hops will have aphids on them. They'll have other bugs on them, and the drying process, um, for one, will actually help to preserve them. Um, they can, believe it or not, get moldy um, and go bad pretty quickly if you just leave them wet in a box somewhere. Um, I mean, within a matter of days, they'll, they'll go bad on you. Yeah, you got to get them dried out. And, uh, yeah, so I do recommend drying them out, um, you know, getting more access to those lupulin glands. Um, yeah, drying out that will actually open up the, uh, the oils exactly, in there and yeah. give you more access to those. And so you'll get a better aromatic off of them without drying them because you don't have the mechanical, um, the, the mechanical force of the actual boiling process to open up those yeah. uh, so yeah, it'll do that. It'll also yeah get rid of those aphids. It'll get rid of those bugs. Um, it'll make for just a cleaner product to add to your beer, which when you're adding something like that late in the beer is always uh, the better way to go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then you, I know a lot of people vacuum pack them, throw them in the fridge yeah. all the day. Dry them before vacuum so, packing them though. Um, yeah, exactly. Dry them out, vacuum pack them. And especially before be worked, freezing, drying them before freezing is really important because if you freeze them wet, you'll, when you warm them back up, they'll just be a mushy goo. Ooh, yeah. No, no bueno there. Um, and then, yeah. And that's it. I think I, that's it for fresh hops. If you've got any questions on fresh hops or using fresh hops or wet hops or anything that we've talked about so far, feel free to leave them. We'll definitely hit them. If not uh, soon, we'll hit them uh, when we get to our Q&A section. So let's move on to topic number two, which is hard cider because as we are picking hops it is also tis the season for hard cidering heck yeah we got um you know we live in washington so we are the state of apples and, and if you think your state has better apples fight me no no, no don't do that uh just send me just, apples i'll yeah, eat just, them yeah just send them to us we'll make see. some hard cider we'll if wanna, compare if you want to send me like 100 pounds of apples <laughs> did you know uh, treetop is from washington treetop's like a yakima company that would make sense yeah doesn't surprise me um anyway we're the so, Apple State. <laughs> so ciders are coming in the season now. Um, this is actually pretty early season, uh, especially for cider apples. A lot of times um, what will the best time to harvest apples is usually after the first frost. Um, and that's because the frost will concentrate the sugars in the apples. means you get more booze. I know I've picked some actually really late in the season, um, like late October I picked some once and ended up making an almost 7% hard cider with no additional sugar added. So, uh, yeah, later in the season equals more sugar for those. Um, but, uh, yeah, otherwise, um, find a uh, local homebrew shop that might be able to rent out a press like we do. Um, and then also I would say, I'm kind of jumping around here, um, but when it comes to cider, the rule of thumb is uh, the more apple varieties you can add to the cider, the better off you're, you're going to be, right? 
Right, and so you 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 want to get a balance of basically acidity, uh, tannin, and sugar. So all those have to be in there, and there are also some aerobatic components that can definitely play a role in uh, in the end cider. And a lot of those actually come from the skins. Uh, before we get too much into the different types of cider that we're using, let's go over the general process of what you're going to do when you get a fresh press and how you're going to make cider. Yeah, so obviously you got you got your apples picked. Um, you're going to run them through um, some kind of a macerator is the first step. So it might be, you know, a rigged up, I've done it through a rigged up uh, garbage disposal actually, yep. um, or some kind of like a food processor. Um, and that's just gonna help you get the best extract as possible. We also rent out an apple crusher. Yeah, um, that works here. great. Uh, so it's got some blades, slices them up, squishes them into, into little bits. Um, and then from there, you're gonna run them through. Or you can do it chicha style and just chew them up and then spit them into the. <laughs> That would be very inefficient, but yes. But you can do it. It would technically work. <laughs> <laughs> and then next you're going to press out that juice. Um, so that's going to be a whole day's work. I will let you know that right now. It is a lot of work to make homemade cider. Um, but now you're left with basically your sweet cider. And you can actually drink that as non-alcoholic cider as is. Um, but typically what most people will do is they're going to either pasteurize it um, or the easier way to do that is to add some Camden tablets or some potassium metabisulfite. Yeah, so you'll add those Camden tablets or metabisulfite, and then 24 hours later, 24 to 36 hours later, that's when you're going to go ahead and add the rest of your ingredients. That's going to be whatever yeast you choose. However, even if you don't add a yeast, it will probably spontaneously ferment within a few days. Uh, I just like to add whatever yeast I'm going to so it can get competitive and push out any potential risk of bacterial infection. So I'll add my yeast 24 hours afterwards, and I will also add pectin enzyme and yeast nutrient at the same time. The pectic enzyme is going to break up the haze forming pectins that are natural in every single fruit and help your cider be crispy and clear at the end of fermentation. And the nutrient is just going to make sure that your yeast is healthy and not producing um, extra phenols or off flavors that, uh, uh, or fusel alcohol kind of flavors that aren't really good for the final cider. Yeah, this is also a good time to add in any additional sugar if your gravity is a little bit lower. Um, most people kind of shoot for that 1050-ish uh, range for a starting gravity. That should get you right in about 6% um, for when that cider finishes out. Um, as for yeast strains, uh, people often ask us what the best one is. And I point to our wall of yeast and say yes. Yeah. <laughs> All uh, yeast strains will make hard cider. They just have a different level of neutral versus not neutral. And really none of them make bad cider. It's just some of them definitely make better, more flavorful ciders, depending on the apples that you have. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to our favorite strains, or at least my favorite strains, it falls in uh, right along those same lines um, that we're doing the seltzers with. Um, typically, any kind of Saison um, yeast or even certain Belgian ale, ale yeast um, that are known for producing really, really high ester profiles work really well. Um, and a lot of people actually come in and they get a little confused when we recommend that because they're going, well, no, I don't want to make an sa apple Saison. I want to make an apple cider. Um, the reality is, is that because of the different types of sugars, these yeast ferment in a very different way. Um, the only way I can really describe it accurately is that um, instead of producing a Saison type flavor profile, they actually accentuate that was that fruity characteristic of the apple itself. They tend to add the perception of sweetness, even though all these will ferment completely dry. Yeah. So they're, they're a good way to make it so that if you are doing a dry cider um, or even like an English style cider, you're going to get a little bit of extra present it, present presentedness. Presentedness. It's got a fuller mouthfeel. Presentedness. <laughs> presents. You're going to get presents on Christmas <laughs> presents. if you use the, the yeast that we suggest. Uh, um, so, yeah, generally, um, yeah, Saisons, Belgian ales, uh, those are going to give you the best results when it comes to your yeast strain. Um, but, yeah, one good note that Peter made is that, um, which a lot of people don't one realize, is that ciders will always ferment dry. Yeah, and so uh, the, speaking of that, when you go into, let's say, packaging, bottling or kegging, uh, you do have the option to back sweeten your ciders. This gets a little bit dicey if you are bottling because any sugars that you add going into the bottles will ferment and it, it turn the cider dry again in return for carbonation. Um, so a lot of people think that they can extra sweeten uh, in the bottles and that doesn't work. That just they makes make geysers bottle or bottle bombs. <laughs> um, so it is a lot easier to back sweeten by killing the yeast and throwing it into a keg and force carbonating. But there are a couple ways that we know of and like to use for bottle sweetening and those are non-fermentable sugars namely stevia and monk fruit yep so that is one way to um, back sweeten 
Uh, the if you do are kegging, you can always add a uh, a compound called uh, potassium sorbate, which in a very over simplified explanation is birth control for yeast um, that will keep any re-fermentation from happening it's plan a <laughs> plan a yeah keep any re-fermentation from happening and then you can actually back sweeten with uh you know some kind of actual apple juice itself um, which you know might be a little bit better um, but yeah if you if you have bottles then using those non-fermentable sugars is the be is the best way to go um, another kind of quick and simple hack which i recommend for a lot of people is just letting the cider be dry um, and then building up some simple syrups. Um, you can have, you know, just a simple sweet syrup. You can have some flavored um, simple syrups and uh, having these on the side so that whenever you decide to drink the cider, um, each person can actually add these syrups to back sweeten it to their own liking. Because yeah. um, the reality is, is some people really like dry ciders while other people like ciders that are like Angry Orchard and sickly sweet and don't even want to say any more about that. Um, but yeah, they can basically add half their, their uh, pint glass with simple syrup. <laughs> yeah. So, or yeah. slightly less. So that, that's the easiest way to go about it and just let it be dry. All right. So we've talked about generally the process of making cider. Someone did mention back sweetening with cranberry juice, which I love because yeah. cranberry juice has both tannin and acidity. So let's talk about if you have a relatively sweet, fresh press of cider, what you have to do to turn that into a cider that's going to be more dynamic and more flavorful in the final vessel. Yeah, so there are a lot of ways you can adjust it. Um, so Peter said tannins. You can actually buy tannin powder. Um, you can also use something like cranberry juice. You can also actually add you know, other types of fruits, that, especially pitted fruits, any kind of a stone fruit. Um, if you add those pits to the cider itself and let those sit on, in the cider for a while, uh, those will also add some tannin. And what that tannin does is if you use too much, it'll actually make it taste really astringent. But if you use just the right amount, it can actually add um, more body to the cider. So it gives you the perception of mouthfeel and a fuller overall, uh, like you said, body that's going to push forward the flavor as well. So it seems like a more dynamic cider. Acids are another thing you're playing around with. If you have a really, really sweet, fresh pressed cider, generally speaking, they're higher pH. And yeasts don't necessarily always ferment the the best way with a higher ph and so uh, a good example is if you ferment a higher ph fresh pressed cider with champagne yeast it's going to taste really dry and really like uh, puffy um, whereas if you do lower that ph just a little bit then all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more balanced and dynamic at the end of it even though it's going to be a dry cider so things like uh, acid blend you can add to help give a more dynamic uh, fermentation or even a little bit of lemon juice pineapple juice things like that that can uh, blend uh, into the cider or yeah. if you have options of what apples are going to crush say, that would be the best way to do it actually yeah. is with the apples themselves you know crab apples some granny smiths yeah <laughs> granny smiths um, building the pans. acid yeah that acid and that uh that tannin with uh, your with your blend of apples um so yeah if you can always use an <clears throat> acidic apple in your blend um i mean just to kind of throw this out there too uh always shoot for an acidic apple an aromatic apple and a sweet apple um, if you can get all three of those in there, you're on the right track for making some really good cider. Yeah, so Pink Ladies are a great example of an aromatic apple. Uh, yeah, so exactly. So those are going to give you that really awesome smell coming from it. The sweet apple um, you want in there because uh, that's going to give you your sugars. Uh, so that's going to bump up your alcohol. It's going to give you the sugars that you want to ferment out. Um, if you do 100% of a sweet apple and cider, they actually taste pretty awful. Um, it ends up tasting kind of like cardboard just because there's really nothing there to back it up. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's going to be your ciders. Um, and then lastly, let's talk about, um, you know, what happens now that we've basically got our finished product. We've added some tannin to it. We've adjusted the acid. Um, and then our, how long are these really going to age for? Because a lot of people think that they have to age out for a long time. Um, and that really depends on, again, the yeast that you use and the alcohol percentage of your cider. A lot of ciders taste really good within the first three to five weeks. Um, and so uh, even though it is on along the same vein as a wine, as long as you're not using certain wine yeasts, uh, it generally will taste pretty good pretty fast. Um, especially if you're planning on back sweetening. Obviously, back sweetening is kind of covering up a lot of flavors, so you can get away with a fresher cider. But uh, once you kill your yeast and keg and back sweeten, you can have a drinkable product within three weeks. Yeah. I would say as a general rule of thumb for every uh, percent alcohol um, that your cider is going to be slash apple wine, you know, we can kind of we can lump this into um, at about a, a week worth of just total fermentation and aging time, right? So, so, you know, we're talking, you know, if you've got a 5%, 6% beer, 
yeah, you know, month, six weeks, sure. Yeah, it'll be ready to go um, if you're using the right kind of yeast. Um, if you got a big old 12 percenter, then it may take um, three a few, months to yeah, six may, months. May take a few months to to actually kind of come together and for some of those fusels to drop out and and uh, for that uh, apple wine to really kind of come uh, flavors to blend properly. So, um, yeah. And I think so. Let's now let's say, oof, excuse me. Um, so if you don't have access to apples but still want to make your own cider, um, one thing to think about is that if you happen to have a orchard near your house, I know in Spokane here we actually have a lot of places that will um, have pressing days where you can actually go and get fresh juice from an uh, from an orchard. I almost said oyster. From an oyster. Uh, from an oyster. Yeah. You can't get fresh juice from an oyster. <laughs> you can't get fresh juice from an oyster. Uh, but yeah, you can get fresh juice from an oyster. Orchard. Oyster. <laughs> you got me going on it. So, um, yeah, go to your local oyster and then get fresh uh, apple juice. Yeah. And then finally, uh, Peter mentioned it earlier, treetop uh, uh, apple juice is actually a fantastic product to work with um, that you can buy straight from the store if you want to play around uh, with making hard cider at home. Um, if you do plan on doing this, if you don't use treetop bram, just make sure that they don't have any kind of preservatives um, in the apple juice because that will inhibit your yeast from fermentation. Otherwise, yeah, a little bit of treetop apple juice, um, maybe a little bit of cranberry juice concentrate and a little bit of uh, apple juice concentrate can make some fantastic uh, hard cider on the cheap and very quickly and easily. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. I use uh, Langer's cranberry juice concentrate. I like Langer's concentrates because they come in plastic bottles, which are really easy to open and manage versus those little cardboard, little twisty off things that are kind of difficult. Yeah. Um, and then I just use the apple cider tree top. Yeah. Uh, Rohit says, or Ro Rohit says uh, smoke cider. Yeah, yeah. It's actually, the, yeah, I'm not going to lie. That sounds delicious. It does sound really good, actually. <laughs> Uh, so. I think you'd have to, so you'd have to probably liquid smoke the, or do some sort of smoking process either to the apples or to the juice itself. Probably the juice. It'd be tricky to infuse it. High surface. No, if you got, a, if you got a sheet pan, high surface area and you smoked into it with a, yeah. like a aluminum foil over, I bet you can smoke it pretty Maybe. good. Maybe. You never know. All right. Well, um, I think that sums up, uh, our hard, hard cider, um, discussion. So let's go ahead and open everything up to general questioning at this point. Yeah. Also, uh, let's get some ideas of videos that, uh, or video games you want us to play on our Twitch channel slash YouTube live streaming for video games. Cause that sounds fun. Ryan, what's the first question you see? Concentrated frozen juice in your, oh, that's uh, okay. Uh, Uh, yeah, so we always add actually our dry hop at the same time as our first. Uh, so uh, this depends on what you're doing. So if you're doing a hazy IPA, then no, you don't want to add your clarifier at the same time as your dry hop because you're doing a biotransformation dry hop. But if you're doing a West Coast dry hop, you can definitely add your first stage dry hop at the same time as your first stage of the clarifier. Um, Michael's asking if we like to brew bitters. And by that, I'm thinking he means, uh, oh, yeah, there you ESBs. go, ESBs. Uh, yeah, um, regular bitters, e ESBs. The tricky part with those is why I love them personally. Um, they they don't tend to sell super well in the tap room. Um, it's just kind of one of those weird styles. Um, ESBs actually do sell all right. Um, those are fantastic too because it uh, doesn't take much to adjust the water chemistry for those. Just basically add some extra hardness to it and you'll be right there, at least with our water around here. Um, but yeah, as for just like typical bitters, they're... Those ones are a little bit too low ABV and not quite enough flavor that people, you know, want to spend five or six dollars a pint for. Um, and uh, we do not use weed to replace hops, by the way. Ryan, think. Tell me another question. I'm trying to read through them right now. Can you bottle condition with what? Oh, can you bottle condition with Quike? Um, yeah, yeah, you totally could. Um, I don't think the beer will necessarily condition uh, faster, though. Um, so if you want to bottle condition um, and add a sort of second yeast to your bottling, um, any yeast is going to do the job. Uh, if you add Quike yeast in there, it's you're not really going to have much of an impact from it. Um, if you use a diastaticus positive strain, which means that one that'll ferment out more sugars than, uh, than you started with, you do have to be careful. 
Um, you know, something like a Saison strain is actually going to dry that beer out over time and you can end up with over carbonation. Uh, but otherwise, if you, if you bottle your beer, keep it warm for, I mean, honestly, if you keep it at a nice, like 70, 75 degree, um, temperature for, you know, even four days, um, that beer should pretty much be, you know, carbonated at least, um, by then, which then you can cold crash and let that CO2 dissolve. So, um, quite if you got it, sure, it's not going to hurt. I don't think it's going to help it go any faster. There was a really good discussion that went on a little bit earlier about how the smoke is going to affect apples and hops this year. Okay. Um, yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of posts from Yakima Valley actually saying that uh, uh, other, because we had really severe windstorms earlier, and a lot of plots were actually destroyed by the windstorm. So hops are already, um, you know, kind of not doing so well. I know that they did a good job trying to, uh, trying to get most of their hops harvested by now. Yeah. So I don't know if this smoke is going to affect it, but I know a couple of years ago, the smoke actually did play a pretty, because it came earlier, actually did play a pretty big role in hops. That was three years ago, I'm going to say. Yeah, Yakima is actually quite a bit ahead of us when it comes to like their whole season. So um, I, I would think that they've actually got the probably, I don't know, 75, 80 percent of the hops harvested already. So if not even more, because I know they're everybody's harvesting their hops in Spokane right now. And Yakima is typically about three weeks ahead. Yeah. Um, so usually the end of August is actually when they're harvesting all their hops. Uh, but yeah, but smoke will affect the growth if it comes a little bit. Oh, early, yeah, totally. So, yeah. yeah, it'll. I mean, it'll actually permeate the hops to some extent. That'd be weird. You start getting packages this winter, and yeah. it's like, why are these hops smoky? Every, everything's got, like, that note of black tea in it. <laughs> You're like, what? Why? Um, uh, yeah, but uh, do expect uh, – <laughs> I, I would go ahead and expect uh, Citra to be pretty expensive this new year just because I know that a huge chunk of Citra crop got uh, destroyed. Yeah. So Rowett uh, is asking about um, how we manage the um, temperature range on yeast packets. Um, so a lot of yeast packages will, will stay to temperature range. He threw out, you know, 18 to 24 degrees Celsius, I take it. Um, and whew, I wish I could give you a really straightforward answer, but when in doubt, uh, shoot for the lower end of the range if you want to keep the beer as clean as possible. Otherwise, it's, it's unfortunately just going to come down to using that yeast strain um, and enough to and, know yeah, exactly what it likes. Experimenting yeah. without that range kind of and knowing how, how to push that because I do know there are some yeast strains like, um, you know, the classic German ale strain, for instance, that uh, we like to ferment on kind of the extreme end of the range. I know some of those will even say like, you know, 60 degrees Fahrenheit is as cold as it'll go. And yet we'll ferment it down, you know, at 57 or 58 degrees, almost lagering temperatures. Uh, whereas, you know, the Vine Stefan yeast strain um, says it'll, it'll, you know, it's a lager up to 65 degrees and we'll ferment it at 70. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, use those as a guideline. The um, colder you pitch it, the bigger you pitch it, more and more and more cells if yeah. you pitch on the cold end. Yeah. Always, though, if, if you want to keep your beers as clean as possible, always err on the cold side, um, just with the mindset of, that beer is probably going to take a little bit longer to ferment out. So yeah, um, beer man 22 said, have you thought about doing a video on making sprites? Um, it's been a while since I've designed video games, so I don't know if I, uh, I, I want to make uh, sprites on making sprites, like, sprites. like up there sprites, like, like the electrical discharges. I thought they made like, like the little thousand feet in the atmosphere, the little video game avatars that have to pop up. Like they have to populate before you know what's going to appear. <laughs> sprites. Apparently you might have to clarify a Sprite for us all. <laughs> I'm guessing he's actually saying spirits. If we want to distill, we totally would. We have the equipment and everything to distill and make a moonshine and all that. Yeah. We and I have a little bit of experience with doing that, but uh, it's, we have a liquor license in this building, uh, which means if we were to yeah, we do anything do that that's other than, you know, <laughs> within the range of our liquor license, we would get in trouble. So we've thought about it, but it probably won't happen unless we end up getting out of this business and doing something outside of it. Actually, you know what? We could, we know enough distillers. We could probably actually go to a distillery and make a video there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say we can, we can make, make that happen for sure. We just gotta have the, we just gotta schedule it. Um, NFL today, beer of the week. Somebody's saying there's a method to our madness where they have the show an hour and 15 minutes to get television for uh, 10 a.m. football. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Next week, we're going to be talking about uh, fantasy football picks. Uh, who to sit, who to play. What? 
Well, you know what? I didn't know football was going to be a thing this year, so I didn't fantasy. Um, Corey's asking if we can get our hands on uh, Verdant IPA yeast and uh, if we've tried it. And uh, We haven't tried it, but we can get our hands on it. We can. Who makes that? Uh, it's a Lalaman product. Oh, all right. Sounds yeah, good. So, yeah, so uh, tropical citrus. It kind of like actually so sounds like yeast. the – I know, right? <laughs> it kind of sounds like the citrus yeast from uh, uh, Imperial, but I haven't used it yet. Yeah, we still need to actually use the the Philly Sour, too. Um, yeah, so, we have some Philly Sour so in here. So we did get a gotta... hold of yeah, some Philly Sour, and we actually got feedback from one person, uh, another actually Precious Things. Fermentation, uh, fermentation Project. Fermentation Project. Shout out to those guys, um, which they've actually already done a batch of beer with it and, and said that they were really blown away by it. So I'm excited to throw that in one of our very, very hopefully soon batches of beer. Yeah. What about the drinkability of smoked beer? I think I can't drink more than two or three pints. Uh, it depends on the smoked beer. There's definitely beers where it becomes uh, cloying or becomes like an mm -hmm. extra uh, on too much on the tongue. Uh, but I've, a really good example is our Stein beer. That's a really soft beer with just yeah. the presence of smoke. Yeah, um, it's, and I think that's kind good. of an example. That's probably why smoked beers aren't more popular is I think a lot of people don't do them right. Yeah. Um, they're not using the right kind of smoked malt or they're not using the right proportions of it um, or they're not <coughs> aging the beers properly. Um, so, so, so there's a lot that goes into smoked beers in general, and I think there's a lot of bad examples, unfortunately, of smoked beers out there, um, so which is probably why their popularity isn't, isn't up there. What percentage of smoked malt would you suggest for a breakfast stout? That entirely depends on the malt. If you're using the best malts, Roush malt, still 20 plus percent is fine. Yeah. If you're using something like uh, Brees' mes uh, Mesquite malt, um, I would probably say that one would be 5 to 7%, pretty on the, yeah. on the low side. Same thing. Uh, yeah, we just got that oat-smoked wheat. That would actually probably go really yeah. good in that. That one you can um, use a little bit more of. Yeah, that one you could probably use yeah, maybe 10%. Um, I wouldn't get too carried away just because that's going to be a bigger beer anyway. Yeah. So, um, everybody's just talking about how bad the air quality is. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, it is. Uh, apparently, we got up over 500, which is nearly the off win. the charts. Hashtag long-term effects. Yeah. Hey, Haven. We got Ryan posting this a bunch of stuff about our Instagram and then telling people yeah. to buy shirts ah, and then arguing with someone who already bought shirts. What do we know about Mangrove Jack Cider Yeast Strain? Uh, a little bit, actually. Uh, it is, so from what I have done on my research, the heritage of it is it, it does actually fall along the lines of a Belgian ale strain. Um, at least it's more Belgian ale than it is wine strain, um, from what I from what I could find. Uh, we've had a lot of people use it. Uh, a lot of our customers use it. I believe we used it in one cider, um, and it does actually work out very well. Um, I still think um, the what is it? Y yeast. It's one of their. It's their Belgian strong. What is that? Thirty six. Thirteen eighty eight. Forty four. Or no. Thirteen eighty eight. Yeah. Um, that is my personal favorite. Um, also, the Bella Saison strain from Wallamond um, is another personal favorite of mine. Um, but yeah, that strain I would give my thumbs up for. Um, it does work quite well. It uh, pronounces the fruit flavor. It's not too. Uh, it's not too aromatic or opening. It's definitely the. Uh, it's not champagne -y though. It's not dry on champagne. -y. Yeah. So it does a really good job of accentuating the apple flavors that you have. Yeah. My opinion is basically anything's better than champagne. Um, I don't want to knock on it too much because I've had, you know, apple wine fermented with champagne yeast and it's still good. Um, but I definitely like prefer other strains when they're available. Um, I would not recommend USO5. I have actually made cider with that and uh, it was not nearly as good. I think that yeast strain is just too clean. And, um, and it yeah. comes across like champagne, but a little bit, a uh, little bit like, yeah, weird. It just wasn't as flavorful. I, yeah. I actually, I split up the same apple juice and fermented it with that um like the uh, belgian strong ale and it was night and day difference between the two beer or two ciders not beers someone's asking so. what our twitch channel is i think it's just genus brewing isn't it oh um is the stuff from green bluff good for making cider from uh 2b2 or 2db um, I'm guessing you guys are local, and yeah, I mean they're uh, they're when they press up there, that's it's really good juice. Um, uh, I would you still need some balance to it, though. I would still recommend adding some acid or tannin. Yeah, a little bit of acid, probably get you where you need to be. Yeah, or you can work with the farmers, and you know they can you can say, hey, can you put a little extra uh, something? Somebody. Uh, any same. tips on starting a homebrew store slash tap room? That's the dream. Uh, the homebrew store store part will be a pain in the ass. Um, yeah, especially but yeah. right now. 
but we have uh, yeah we have uh, a lot of tips especially on the tap room and brewery side of it uh, um, okay yeah start it start small and then uh, work your way big get partners get people to help work with you instead of trying to one man show it yeah um, pick a really populated area um, so we got uh, Idaho Farmhouse Ales is asking us how we use spunding valves and uh, or if we use them much more. Yes, so. we always and use spunding yeah, valves. Yeah, we actually we have a couple three around here now, and uh, we use the living daylights out of those things. Uh, so uh, hey, thank you. Somebody just super chatted us. Um, and uh, for those of you that are not familiar with spunding valves, what they are is they are a diaphragm valve um, that's just a pressure regulator. Um, so if you have a pressurizable fermenter, um, you're going to put those on there and you're going to basically set a certain pressure for the beer to ferment at. Um, we do that uh, for uh, about a couple, three reasons, actually. Um, the first reason is um, we spun to save on CO2. Uh, that's yeah. kind of the simplest thing. So um, we'll, a, lot, a lot of cases, we'll just kind of open ferment and then actually close down that valve towards the end of fermentation get that pressure up to about 15 PSI or so before we cold crash, um, which means that we're saving um, half, if not a little bit more of the gas we need to carbonate that um, beer at. Um, and then the second reason is uh, for blow off reasons If we have a full fermenter. If we can ferment that at uh, you know, 8, 10 PSI, um, that's actually gonna keep that Krausen from getting too aggressive. Um, it's actually gonna slow down that fermentation just a touch um, and keep us from blowing beer all over the place. Uh, and then lastly, um, which is a little less like kind of um, hard science behind it, is that if we're doing IPAs, the theory is that that pressure will keep a lot of those um, volatile aromatics in the beer um, it, so that um, if you pressure ferment the whole time, you're going to have more of those in the keg, in the glass when you serve that final beer. And that super chat was from Bruno Dave and says, thanks for personally the most relevant information regarding wet hops and hard cider. I appreciate you super chatting us. That uh, always makes us feel good when people uh, appreciate the knowledge that we're, that we're given on the, on the live stream. So thank, thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. Most people, I mean, fresh hops are always tricky to use too. Yeah. That's uh yeah, we've, uh, we've definitely learned our, our do's and don'ts with them. I've plugged up plenty of, of <laughs> orifices with uh fresh hops you're not the only one who's plugged up orifices oh gosh yeah, i shouldn't have said that <laughs> someone says any experience with brewing a beer with additional apple juice uh actually fun story we once bought a 250 gallon tote of apple juice and did not sell nearly as much of it as we thought we would <laughs> and, and so fermented. and then we uh so we made a lot of beer with it <laughs> we made a really good barrel aged saison with it actually uh, uh, yeah and we made a shandy with it uh is it sizer sure yeah is, it, is that the technical <laughs> term yeah but uh yeah no it was uh uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it does thin out the beer. So you got to figure out where it's going to, it's going to, and it's also going to kind of dilute the flavor of the beer. Yeah. Um, so it's really good for light beers or acidic beers. Yeah, but no, that was, that was, I think it is a sizer is technically what that was. Yeah. So we like <clears> did <throat> almost half apple juice, half beer wort, um, in a wheat beer base and then, uh, threw some lemon juice at it and it was like, woo, shandy, dry, acidic deliciousness. When should you add ascorbs and water additions in general? Uh, we like to add all those into the mash. Yeah, that's that's a, just a good thing. Yeah, ascorbs you can add. Throw it in the ascorbs you can add during fermentation or during packaging as well. Um, it uh, uh, it reduces certain things in the mash though that make it less likely to oxidize down the road. So I think it's just a good idea to add in the mash. Mm. Smoky hops may be a new trend. Uh, Gern's asking Maybe. us about the uh, new Anvil foundries and whether they can step mash. Did, did, have you heard about that? I know we. We do have them in now because I know that's a different model because the little temp gauge is up top now. Um, I don't know if they can snap mash. Is it, we they? did get them in and they uh, they can step mash. Yeah, so uh, they don't. It's not programmable though. Is that, that what I think that's yeah. what he's asking. Yeah. It's, so. uh, yeah, I don't think it's a programmed step mash. Um, so it's still not to the point where like uh, if you had like the grandfather and you can do it all from your phone. Yeah. It's not For that point yet. Brew, I think you could set those too, couldn't you? Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so I don't think you can do it automatically. Honestly, I don't think you'd want to do it automatically uh, anyways. I like to kind of keep an eye on mine just to make sure it's not sticking. It's still recirculating because if you end up, for whatever reason, getting like a stuck recirculation and then it's still trying to step mash, you might end up scorching the bottom. So I don't know if I'd want it to do it automatically, but yeah, uh, yeah so I don't think it does. But Adam's asking how, how <laughs> often we check the uh, pH of our beers. Uh, depending on the beer, not very often. 
If um, it's a sour, or, maybe. Or if at all, yeah. <laughs> actually. Yeah, if it's a sour, um, if we're trying to do a kettle sour on it, um, then that's when we're going to check our pHs pretty frequently just to get down to the level we want. Um, otherwise, we just sort of rely on our experience. Um, we rely and on, our taste buds. On Yeah, we rely on our also, <coughs> you know, our additions to the mash, you know, whether we're adding acid malt to the mash or lactic acid um, to make those adjustments from the get-go. After that, the yeast is going to take off. It's going to do its thing. Um, honestly, there's not much you really want to do about it after that. So, um, yeah. Someone's saying they are currently wearing their genus T-shirt while brewing an amber ale, so hope it turns out that much better. Uh, that is actually scientifically proven to help. Uh, if you are wearing a genus T-shirt, your beard does turn out better. That's uh, That's been proven. It's also in the Bible. <laughs> um, Ryan, did you add like a loading picture, like a picture of a loading thing? Just so people would think something's going to pop up. Yeah, oh, jeez. All right. Ryan, so saying, Ryan's very ADD. Oh, graph. Is that, is that what we made? Graph. Yeah, probably. That might be. Yes. I think that, so they're referring to the uh, apple juice beer combo. Um, yes, I, that might be a graph. I think you're right. Uh, oh, no. Ryan, have you, made a, have you posted yeah. that uh, we're closed today video thing post picture? All right. Have we used fresh hops in mead? <coughs> uh, yes, or, we have. Yeah. Uh, and you, William, it's my favorite one. Yeah. Uh, with mead, you have to be you have to tone it w way down. Um, yeah. Same thing actually with cider. Um, yeah. You can use. Uh, yeah, we probably should have talked about that in our discussion topics. Honestly, um, you can actually add hops to both meads and cider. You generally want to use them at a much much lower rate um, than you would in any kind of beer, mostly just because they're going to come through very potently. Um, I re usually recommend a starting rate of about one ounce of regular hop pellets. Uh, per five gallon batch of, of mead or cider. Um, that's going to give you a, a or at least it should give you plenty of flavor profile um, to them. You can use the cryo hops too. They seem to work pretty well for that. Um, again, you want to kind of cut that in half. So now you're looking at, you know, a half ounce. If you want a real subtle note of it, um, even something like a quarter ounce um, will, will actually still give you plenty of flavor. Micatha says, what should I brew uh, for a fourth try with a healthy London Ale 3 after a few hoppy pails? My thought, Imperial Amber. Imperial Amber? Yeah, so okay. London Ale 3 is slightly malty, slightly fruity. Yeah. Uh, you've got a couple builds up with some hoppy pails, so there's already some hops kind of in there. Yeah. You don't know if you're going to get it all the way. Uh, yeah, my, my thought's Imperial Amber. Go for something like 7.5%, get it a little extra malty sweet, um, and try to aim for that, uh, that slightly high alcohol um, profile. That's a really good yeast for it. Kind of depends on what you want. Honestly, it's a really universal yeast. You can make pails with it, IPAs, ambers, porters. Yeah. It's very, it's just subtly malt leaning and subtly fruity. So, but you know, I think tis the season. It's getting into fall. You got a little bit of colder weather coming on. Imperial Amber sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, sure does. Hey, by the way, I just want to say thanks to everybody that's been watching um, because uh, it sounds like we have a ton of people that are literally watching us as they're brewing beer, which kind of kind of hits me right in the heart. Oh yeah, um, got got the feels going on. Um, so for all of those out there that have not hit the uh, thumbs up, please do so right now. Um, we sure appreciate it. It Helps us uh, keep these videos coming out to you. Yeah, and so. gets it out to more people in the afterness time. So all right. Have you guys ever made a good peanut butter beer? We are making one right now. Yeah, sure are. Um, and we made a PB and J sour. And we made a PB and J. That was such a weird beer. Uh, so that people loved that. that, that I was one, gonna say that, that was right up there off. with the Hawaiian pizza beer. <laughs> I don't know if it was that weird. Uh, it's pretty weird. Uh, but yeah, fantastic beer. Uh, so yeah, so t Peter, tell them how um, what the best way to uh, do a peanut butter and jelly sour is. So uh, I feel uh, like that's a good thing to hit on. Well, the peanut butter and jelly. Well, peanut or butter. Not, peanut sorry, butter. Peanut butter and beer. Yeah, peanut butter and beer in general is kind of a weird thing to do, and I think the biggest mistake that I see a lot of people make is they go too much of one way to flavor it with peanut yeah. butter. So they'll go too much peanut butter extract in secondary or in packaging, and that can get really weird and fake and sweet and too much. But a little bit of it can actually emphasize some other peanut butter flavor that might be in there already. So I split that uh, peanut butter extract that I do in packaging with some PB2, which we do at the end of the boil or the whirlpool. Um, that gives a different kind of peanut butter flavor a little bit of that richer uh, nutty flavor and then you can also build some malts around kind of developing that flavor so the trick to a good peanut butter beer is actually not doing too much peanut butter but just doing different ways of kind of building that peanut butter perception uh, little bits at a time and then they all come together to make a good peanut butter flavor in the final product without being too sweet or too distracting uh, 
So Garage Brewing um, just kind of is asking. So they said that they made a raspberry milkshake sour IPA. Nice. <laughs> right up our alley um, with some raspberry puree. But they said it's got too much of a tannic characteristic to it. Um, and so they're wondering if the tannins come from the fruit or, or the sour itself. Um, the fruit was only on the beer for 36 hours, too. Um, I would say it's probably not from the fruit, but I will say that the extra acidity can make a little bit of tannin be pushed forward even more. Uh, that said, there's a lot of ways that you can get that perception of tannin. Uh, mm -hmm. It could be from certain ways of hopping. It can be from actually yeast productivity, things that yeast produce. Um, if the yeast are naturally more phenolic, then they're going to produce things that feel like tannin. Uh, of course, you are going to get some tannin from the fruit. Uh, that said, that for 36 hours, and if it's a puree, you really shouldn't have much. Yeah, um, that's. And then the sourness just kind of pushes all those more forward. If I were to kind of take my best stab at, at this one, I would say that um, what you're perceiving as being tannic is actually probably some uh, hop bite. Um, and it's probably from uh, whatever kind of whirlpool hop stand you did. Might have gone a little bit too long or you might have got a little bit too much hop material in, in your fermenter. Um, and it might actually be just a little bit of like a, a chlorophyll bite. Um, and it could just be yeast bite actually too. Um, if you're, it could be a combination of those. Um, if your yeast was a little bit stressed out, if it is yeast bite, the, the beauty of that is it'll settle um, out. It generally goes away within a few weeks. So my, uh, my, my guess would be whatever tannic quality is in there, just guessing by how you made the beer mm -hmm. is going to mellow out or go away. And if not, uh, if, if it's tasting a little dry too, you can always try to find a way to sweeten it a little bit at the end. Yeah. Even with like a, uh, like a syrup or something like that, like a raspberry syrup. Hey, and you know, we've used those. I, I'm not going to say that we haven't, um, and they do actually work really well. So they're a good quick uh, fix or they're yeah, an easy they, fix. Yeah. They're, uh, I mean, not even fix, but we even just dosed kegs with them just playing around and it, and it actually, if, if you're doing it properly, it can, it can take a good beer and add another layer of flavor to it. So I'm, I am not against it. I will not say that I am that much of a purist. Yeah. I mean, even me though either. I'm definitely more of a purist than you are. That's true. <laughs> I'll, I'll do anything. As long as I can make something that tastes good, I'll do anything. Pretty much. Um, all right. Any more questions out there? Please send them in now. Um, we'll actually, in fact, I'm happy to go a little bit uh, longer today since, you know, we aren't having to open. So send in those questions and we will try to get them answered. Have you guys playing in the background while brewing a Nipah? Oh, nice. We're playing in the background while brewing a Nipah this morning. Sweet. Wow. <laughs> Garage Brewing is going to send us one of those beers he thinks is tannic. Watch, it'll get here and it'll be like, actually, that's cleaned up now. Yeah, I don't taste anything. Perfectly crispy <laughs> <by now. laughs> that, that warming up process in the mail <laughs> cleaned it right up. By the time it gets here, it'll be a smoked beer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's Roush Sour. <laughs> it'll be yeah. a uh, smoked sour <laughs> IPA. Yes. <laughs> I'm not opposed. <laughs> smoked sour milkshake. I do want to try a smoked cider now. Like, now that we've got that uh, the idea of the smoked cider out, I feel uh, like it's something that'd be super fun <laughs> to do. Do we add minerals to sparge water? Depends if we're doing So if I'm doing a session beer, that means a very, very low amount of uh, grain for the amount of water that I'm getting into the boil. Then I'll almost always acidify the sparge water, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to add minerals to it. Yeah. I add minerals basically assuming that they're all going to dissolve and get into the boil. And then that's going to kind of concentrate in the boil. So the mineral additions that I do, I'll do all those in the mash. I don't add minerals to the sparge water, but I will sometimes acidify the sparge water if I think it's going to get to um, alkaline. Uh, Shannon is asking about a plate chiller we would recommend because they are not happy with the counterflow chiller that comes with the grandfather. Um, and, uh, if you are using the grandfather system, I, you're probably not gonna want to hear this, but I would not recommend a plate chiller. Um, and that's just because there's not a very good way to pre filter in that, in that system specifically. If you're going to use a plate chiller, you gotta, you gotta have some kind of pre filtration. Otherwise you're going to plug those things up every single time. Um, I would, I would honestly think about like a good quality 50 foot immersion, um, coil. Um, those a lot of times can be just as effective as the counterflow chiller. Um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would stay away with a plate chiller unless you have a really good way to, to pre-filter before it's hitting that. So, um, that is my two cents there. Um, can I make a good cider from concentrated apple syrup? Yes, you can. It would just kind of depend on uh, what you're trying to go for. Um, yeah. So, oh, I mean, you can make a good cider from a lot of things, honestly. Uh, but, yeah, concentrated apple syrup, you can definitely dilute out. Uh, you might have to play around with some other sugar additions as well. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, I would say you can go ahead and ferment that too, but I would also recommend probably back sweetening with that. Uh, use some store-bought water too when you uh, are dissolving it or diluting it out. Why is my live stream so far behind? There we go. I don't know. Why is your live stream? We, we have it on low uh, latency, so it should be yeah, updating no, relatively it's quickly. because I paused it, apparently. I didn't know you could do that. Um, <laughs> All right. What should I brew for my first uh, beer on a five-liter Brewzilla system? Five-liter. I didn't know they made five-liter systems. That is a very small system. Maybe it's 15-liter? That doesn't make sense. 50-liter, probably. I thought it's 30 and 60, though. I don't know. Maybe it's just a 50-liter batch. Uh, I, I always recommend first beers on new systems being brown ales. Brown? That's a random one. That's what I like to write. That's I recommend brown ales for first beers <laughs> on right. new systems. Sure, you know? brown ale will work. They're forgiving. They're uh, they're yeah. tasty. They can be both sessionable and mouthy. Yeah, I I would just say honestly, any anything that has a wide range of um, sort of starting gravity it can fall within. Yeah, that's that's going to be the biggest thing when you're brewing on a new system is the volume you end up with and your starting gravity. Um, yeah. The, uh, it's, it's very unlikely that you're going to be like, ah, sweet, I'm one point off. Usually it's going to be like, oh, I just ended up with uh, four and a half gallons and I'm off by eight points, <laughs> which if you're doing uh, an American lager probably isn't the best. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but yeah, you know, anything that, that you got a nice little little wiggle room, I would say an ESB, somebody's asking about that, that would be another one that yeah. would work really well. Got so, a range. You can do yeah, a, exactly. you can end a up bitter, with a, a special bitter, or an extra, extra ESB special. With a 5% ESB or a 7% ESB. It's all the same. Um, Someone's asking, my NEPA pH during fermentation is 4.3. Is that too low? No, it's not. Uh, your yeah. your NEPA will probably finish out low fours, maybe a little bit lower. When you dry hop, it'll actually raise slightly. So yeah, that's um yeah. For those of you that aren't uh, aware of it out there, as your yeast ferments, it's going to continue to drop that pH. So you know that 5.1, 5.2 pH that you end up with um, in your mash, uh, and you know probably even a little bit less than that in the, in the beer going into the fermenter. Uh, is actually going to end up continuing to drop um, during fermentation. So, um, with that said, your dry hops will actually bump it up just a little bit at yeah. the end. So, uh, have we tried brewing a glue beer? And do we have any tips? No, we haven't. I don't even know what that is. A what? G L U H B I E R. There are so many things now. This is awesome. Yeah, that that one's new on me. Are hard seltzer line items uh, selling just as much as beer? Uh, and to answer your question, uh, Trev, who uh, I would say that it is. Uh, it's still very early in kind of the 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 uh, boom of hard seltzers to say. Ooh, it's a mold beer, like mold wine. A, but with oh beer. yeah, okay, I see that. Um, I would say it's early to say in hard seltzers, but with the one that we put out, I would say. It was highly competitive with our light beers on tap. Um, when it comes to you know like like you know Blondales or something like that, I would say it was selling right on pace with those beers. And I think if we would market them a little bit more and maybe have a couple options on on tap, then they will actually start outselling a lot of the light beers. Yeah, um, just because those are going to be the main competitors. Obviously, somebody that wants a hazy IPA isn't going to go for a seltzer instead. Um, but yeah, definitely a lot of light beer competition there. Um, so. Yeah, so glue beer, if I'm pronouncing that right, is a, it's like a mulled wine, but with beer. Uh, so I've actually made a lot of mulled wines. That sounds good. Um, I'm, I haven't read too much about it, but it sounds like a fun thing to make. And I'm wondering, I'm guessing you're, yeah, it's something you drink hot. So spiced mm. beer, drink hot. You serve it out of a crock. Obviously, it's not going to be carbonated if you're drinking a hot. But uh, challenge accepted. Yeah, sounds fun. <laughs> we actually did a. Uh, it is carbonated. It's just under 40 psi as you're drinking it. <laughs> It's going to be like me with the Pluto gun when we got uh, whatever subscribers. That was our 5,000 subscriber keg stand. I'm pretty sure beer shot out my nose at about 20 miles an hour. Duh. Uh, <laughs> I'm just cleaning you up. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, we just got to find a way to, to get a crock pot that can pressurize that high uh, <laughs> and still tap it. Uh, all right. Is that, uh, looks like that might be about everything, actually. Can we talk about malt usage in a red ale to really try to get some good flavors and nice red color? Someone mentioned using Special B rather than Crystal. 100% agree with using Special B rather than Crystal, although Special B is also a little bit on the sweet side. I would say use Special X. Uh, you can use a small amount of Special X and get a phenomenal red color. Uh, 
and it's not going to be overly sweet. It's going to be subtly nutty and toasty with yeah. a hint of sweetness, a little bit of that raisiny sweetness, but not nearly as much as like a special bee. Um, yeah, even a little bit of brown mm. malt wouldn't hurt anything. If you want to darken up that color, um, a little bit of uh, even like a pale chocolate malt is is always sort of um, in the back of my wheelhouse when it comes to uh, when it comes to color adjustments. Uh, it's about what does pale chocolate run color wise? It's like two hundred or something. Yeah, like two fifty. Um, Depends yeah. on the pale chocolate. Actually, no, they might even be only one hundred and fifty. Um, There's but one brand, not ours, but there is a brand that's uh, less lower and like that. Yeah, um, but yeah, so a nice, uh, really good malt to add color adjustment without adding a lot of flavor. Um, on honestly, just an ounce or two of that, and something like a red can add a lot of uh, a lot of color to it. So uh, yeah, Caroma is another one. Um, that's kind of in that same special X wheelhouse. Uh, we have another, we even have another malt that's one of those super, super dark crystals. Um, I would say just very small amounts of those, you know, two ounces, maybe three. Um, get you, get you all kinds of little complex. Gotta get you, get you, get your head in the game. Uh, someone's asking, doing a plum wine today, is regular old white sugar okay to bump up the OG? Yes, but whenever you add simple sugars like that, I also always recommend to add nutrient as well. Um, and uh, if you're already planning on doing nutrients, you might have to add it just a little extra to make sure that you're compensating from the simple sugars. Yeah. Also, add more plums to bump up the sugar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> always add, always Lo add more fruit first. Logan will send you some plums. I'll send you plums. I got plums. Trust me, like plums. Um, anyway <laughs> don't know what he just said that was weird all right that looks like all the questions if there's not anything else i guess we're going to start wrapping this up get on to making some more videos for you uh before we leave please give this video a thumbs up a like on this will help us tremendously if you're not already subscribed to the channel please subscribe to the channel um and we will see you next week next um, sunday 8 45 a.m pacific standard time perfect thank you so much everybody have a great brewing day. Follow us on Instagram. Comment on Ryan's cool pictures. And uh, yeah, Instagram. Do we we actually have a Twitch account now, don't we? Yeah, we do. Oh jeez, uh, we we've, we've had one. Great. Uh, Instagram, Twitch, the Facebergs, all of those good stuffs. Uh, thank you so much. I guess Ryan can hit end stream. I don't even need to get up today.